In this lecture, we will be examining the emergence of a consumer-oriented culture and economy in the United States. Consumerism can be defined loosely as a socioeconomic system that promotes the purchase and consumption of goods and services. In the United States, consumerism has become an integral part of American culture. Even simple products such as baby powder, as pictured in the 1894 advertisement on this slide, became goods that could be aggressively marketed in ways that appealed to a growing American consumer culture. The United States over the course of the 19th century moved from a producer economy based on hard work and frugality to a consumer economy in which material wealth and leisure activities became intertwined with identity. Native-born Americans started relocating from rural regions to urban centers in this century. This map shows the change over time of rural versus urban populations in the United States. After the Civil War, the shift to an urban focus accelerated, and this increasing urbanization brought with it a rise in consumer culture. Many Americans in the late 19th century became employed by national corporations, which is a significant change from earlier eras where local businesses employed most workers. Millions of Americans began working in professional and managerial roles in the expanding white collar sectors of the US economy. These new job categories often involved higher incomes, higher social status, and shorter work days. In part, changes in the American economy allowed for a new emphasis on consumer goods and leisure activities. Other native-born middle-class Americans stayed in rural regions, but here, too, patterns of leisure and consumption were likewise altered. Mail-order catalogs and chain stores brought an ever-increasing variety of goods and services to millions of new American consumers, bringing the newly emergent specter of American consumerism right to the front doors. The mechanization associated with the Industrial Revolution is closely associated with the emergence of American consumerism. Increased industrial output led to lower consumer prices. This also encouraged the development of new consumer goods. One example of the effects of mechanization on American culture can be found in the example of sewing machines. The clothing industry was revolutionized by the development of the sewing machine. Uh, this allowed personal wardrobes for middle class and upper class Americans to grow significantly in the size and variety. Many people began to purchase clothing for different times of the day and for a variety of settings. Clothing was no longer seen as sort of perfunctory or mundane simply for work purposes. Items such as uh, parlor jackets and slippers became in high demand. Similarly, immigrants and rural migrants who sought status in the rapidly expanding American middle class, purchase inexpensive factory-made clothes to better fit in with their new surroundings. The mechanized sewing machine itself became a highly prized possession, and these machines made quick work of formerly time-consuming activities, such as darning socks or hemming trousers, freeing up American women for greater amounts of leisure time. Now, this is not to say that American women were sort of liberated by the sewing machine, but rather that they too could become um, more involved in the emerging consumer and leisure economies. An important component in the emergence of American consumerism was the rise in significance of advertising as a means of informing consumers and shaping fashion trends. Expenditures in the United States for advertising were less than $10 million a year in 1865, but by 1900, this amount had increased to almost hundred million dollars per year so that's tenfold in uh, 35 years pictured on the uh, left is an 1894 advertisement for coca-cola which touts the benefits of the uh, the beverage as a supposed brain tonic pictured on the left is an 1899 advertisement for ice skates the Finnish people were probably the first uh, ice skaters in world history, there's archaeological evidence that suggests that they have been ice skating for thousands of years. Uh, but in the late 19th century, the sport began to become extremely popular 
as a pastime in the northern half of the United States. Part of this intense interest in ice skating was driven by advertising. Uh, this was a form of middle and upper class entertainment uh, that eventually began to cross all socioeconomic boundaries. And it became seen as a sort of social necessity, especially in romantic interaction between young couples. Innovations in food processing technology contributed to the rise of American consumerism. Individuals such as John Harvey Kellogg and Charles Post were noted for the development of ready-to-eat cereal products. Post marketed his first breakfast cereal as a brain food. You can see some of that on there for brain and nerve centers, a food, uh, this grape nuts. Uh, he had changed after some... Um, some consumer testing from the original name of Postum, named after himself, uh, to Grape Nuts. Kellogg was a physician, and uh, he operated a facility known as the Battle Creek Sanitarium. He developed his cornflakes cereal as an ideal food for a healthy life. Kellogg believed that most diseases, both physical and mental, were caused by intestinal problems. He believed his cereal was much more... Uh, than just a food to be bought or sold. This was a way of life. Now, both companies touted the numerous benefits of eating cereals in their advertising, including uh, consumer convenience, because they had a long shelf life, and uh, the improved health for those who ate their products. Baby food and infant formula preparations um, emerged on a much wider scale in the late 19th century. Initially, companies like Nestle entered the marketplace with products designed to assist mothers whose children would not breastfeed. But this market uh, proved to be relatively small. As the 19th century wound down in the United States, though, most infants were still breastfed. However, the number of American mothers who breastfed their children began a steady downward decline as the 20th century began. And gradually, breastfeeding became associated with poverty, with lower socioeconomic status, and with poor infant health, uh, while infant formulas were seen by many people as healthier options and the behavior associated with women from higher socioeconomic classes. Now that's not to say that any of this is true. Uh, this was a large, uh, in, in large measure, this was a function of the advertising of infant formula manufacturers who quickly learned that American women responded favorably to their marketing mix of messages that linked uh, infant formulas with healthy babies and wealthy families. American companies in the emerging consumer culture found that medicines were especially profitable and easily marketable goods. Pictured here is a patent medicine known as Lydia Pinkham's vegetable extract on the left. The package touts the medicine, here's a quote, for all those painful complaints and weaknesses so common to our best female population. The advertisement on the right, which is also for Lydia Pinkham's vegetable extract, suggests the extract is quite useful for an unmarried woman and the, quote, painful ordeal of a gynecological examination. Um, the only ingredient in uh, Pinkham's patent medicine that likely affected people who consumed the product was ethyl alcohol, as Lydia Pinkham's vegetable extract uh, contained approximately 23% 23, 23 alcohol or 46 proof, so it would be up there with uh, like slow gin or something. Um, in the emerging consumer marketplace, many Americans came to believe that material and physical improvements could be purchased by anyone with the money to pay for them. Other, matins, other patent medicines, sorry, um, in this time period, 1890s, early 1900s, contained substances such as opium, morphine, and cocaine. Still, despite the pervasiveness of quack patent medicines, the overall result of late 19th century industrialization was to make available legitimate medicines to many more Americans, and companies began to invest in research and development of drugs to treat and cure a wider variety of diseases. As the Civil War came to an end, in this time period, most urban women shopped every day. They baked their own bread, they canned their own fruits and vegetables. And uh, by 1900, though, the domestic chores of urban 
middle class and wealthy women had been reduced by such changes as indoor plumbing, better stoves, better furnaces, prepared foods, and washing machines. Other changes in American homes during this time period included such features as uh, central heating, electric power, and telephones. These changes uh, helped provide greater leisure time for American women, and the number of American women, for example, who attended college also began to grow in the late 19th century. Pictured in this image are members of the 1896 Vanderbilt University uh, women's basketball team. Um, but again, this is not to suggest that uh, technological change or consumer culture liberated women or somehow uh, ended the discrimination, but rather that they were freed up time-wise to be more full participants in the leisure economy. The corset is an item of clothing that is designed to sort of compress the torso or the abdomen into a desired shape for aesthetic reasons. Pictured on the uh, right is an example of the fashioned trend known as the wasp waist. This fashion ideal, which made use of corsets and girdles to achieve, derives its name from the resemblance to the sort of segmented body of a wasp, the insect. Sociologist Thorstein Veblen, who we will examine later in this lecture, criticized the corset as a form of modern mutilation of women. And yet this uh, beauty ideal for the time period was highly prized and women spent a great deal of money uh, purchasing devices like the corset to help them achieve that ideal. Women, however, were not the only ones targeted uh, with corset advertising. Depicted on this slide is an 1893 advertisement for a product known as Reist's Patent Invigorator Belt. Of course, you had to uh, genderize it in a way to make it more palatable to men. You couldn't call it a girdle or a corset since these had been associated with women. The ad uh, claims that besides showing off the figure and enabling the tailor to ensure an effective fit and distinguished appearance, this combined uh, patent invigorator belt is a necessity to most men for the promotion of health and comfort, together with an upright soldierly bearing. It expands the chest, it supports the spine, and holds the figure erect. It protects the lungs and kidneys from cold, and it supports the stomach. And for a mere 11.95, you too, if you were a man, uh, could purchase a patent invigorator belt. The emergence of mail order catalogs brought consumerism to Americans living in small towns and in rural regions. Uh, through volume purchasing, through efficient railroads, and through the expansion of the U.S. Postal Service, mail order companies presented an alternative to rural stores, which tended to have significantly higher prices due to higher overhead and higher purchasing costs. By 1884, for example, Mon the Montgomery Ward catalog offered nearly 10,000 items to its rural customers. Uh, in 1887, um, Warren Sears, S-E-A-R-S, created a competing mail order company that was based in the city of Chicago. And rapidly, the Sears Roebuck Company outpaced Ward's in the vast array of goods offered to consumers. By 1900, for example, Sears offered almost 40,000 items in its catalogs. Um, by 1910, over 10 million Americans shopped by mail for consumer goods. Um, the U.S. Postal Service in 1896 introduced something known as uh, Rural Free Delivery, RFD. The RFD system brought packages directly to every home. Sears originally advertised such good as, goods as agricultural supplies, medicine, uh, tools and clothing and appliances, uh, guns, and uh, merchandise for babies. Typically, these catalogs contained a wide variety of goods for an extensive range of income levels. For example, in these 1908 Sears ads, bicycle options ranged between $8.95 and $15.95 apiece, and these models, or there were also models, excuse me, that Sears offered that were less expensive as well as more costly on other pages in the catalog. By the end of the 19th century, uh, the Sears catalogs and Ward's catalogs were made available in Swedish and German editions for Midwestern families of Northern European descent. 
these catalogs made available an entirely new realm of consumer goods to people who had previously little access to more to much more than the uh, basic necessities. These catalogs also subtly influenced and informed readers about the standards of middle class fashions. Customers perusing through a catalog would gradually learn more about uh, about such things as color and fabric coordination or uh, to learn to distinguish between a dinner fork and a salad fork. By 1908, Sears began marketing kits that contained all of the parts necessary to build entire houses. Through the Sears mail order system, the Sears modern homes began to appear all, all across the country. The image on the left is a uh, 1919 ad for a Sears home model known as the Alhambra which sold for just under $2,000 at the time. This would be about $26,000 in 2012 figures. Uh, the price did not include electrical or plumbing materials, though these also could be purchased through Sears and the catalog division. Interestingly, thousands of these uh, Sears homes are still standing and being used. Some of them have proven to be quite, uh, quite durable. Pictured on the right is a 1912 model Sears home known as a Craftsman Bungalow from the uh, Phoenix, Arizona area. But you can find them all over the country. We even have some in my, uh, the town in which I reside right now, which is Toledo, Ohio. Um, consumerism uh, is linked very closely with the rise of chain stores in the United States. 1879, F.W. Woolworth opened the first of his five and 10 cent stores in Utica, New York. He sold items like crochet needles, soap, thimbles, harmonicas. Uh, Woolworth found that if he offered an item at a low price, the consumer would purchase it on the spur of the moment, hence the name Five and Dime or Five and Ten Cent Store. By 1911, the Woolworth chain had 596 stores and sold a million dollars of merchandise per week. Together with the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, which we would today, if I don't know if there's that many around, the A&P stores, they were kind of a feature when I was growing up, but uh, I am graying, so, uh, but they were along the lines of a modern day Kroger or uh, a similar grocery store. These companies uh, led the way for the emergence of retail chain stores um, that emphasized extremely attractive pricing and consumer choice. As the 19th century drew to a close, the city of Chicago emerged as a trailblazer in the development of the department store which was a uh, central feature of and a symbol of the nation's emerging consumer culture. The rise of department stores represented a significant danger to smaller retail business owners. Small merchants initially attempted to rouse the public against these, uh, uh, at least to them, hated new giant department stores. These efforts were largely unsuccessful, though. In a way, this kind of reminds me of uh, the emergence of the Walmart in the late 20th century as a competitor to small town merchants and that same sort of backlash that uh, has emerged in some in some sectors of the economy. Other folks uh, uh, love their Walmarts. The most important figure in the history of retail in Chicago was Marshall Field. His business was one of the most influential in the nationwide development of the department store. Pictured here is the, the Marshall Field and Company retail store. Field's motto was simple. Uh, and it's genderized, but it's uh, give the lady what she wants. So he was definitely targeting uh, a specific component of the uh, American population. The Fields Corporation is also known for the common expression, the customer is always right, and they prided themselves on uh, unconditional money-back guarantees and refunds. Uh, they were also noted for consistent pricing policies and uh, their importation of, um, at the time, um, relatively scarce or highly prized international goods. And these are some of the field developments became standards in the American retail industry. Fields was also noted for in his stores for the impressive displays of opulence and wealth in the facilities. Customers would often be awed, for example, in the Chicago store by the Tiffany ceilings and the uh, sheer extravagance of the 12-story flagship store you can see here. These lavish displays of wealth also subtly served to influence consumers to believe that everything in the store was of higher quality than retail and than other retail outlets, even if it was uh, turned out to be the exact same goods. 
Marshall Fields offered the country's first bridal registry, he offered the first in-store restaurants in a major department store. So more amenities to, uh, to please consumers. Interestingly, Fields found that customers would shop about 50% longer if they could just take a break and eat food. So maybe a precursor to the modern day uh, food court in malls. The store was also the first American retailer to offer personal shopping assistants who would uh, either shop for you or uh, go with you to help you pick out goods. By 1910, the annual sales of the field store exceeded $60 million. One of the most important features of American consumerism as it emerged in the late 19th century was its emphasis on acquiring material goods as a means of establishing identity, especially as it related to socioeconomic class. With the ar arrival and wide availability in the marketplace of goods traditionally considered luxury items, Americans who occupied or hoped to occupy middle class status could assert their position in the social hierarchy with the clothing and goods they purchased. This early 20th century photograph features middle class men from Napa Valley, California. They're wearing clothing associated with the Edwardian fashion style of the early 20th century. Uh, the fact that this fashion trend could so quickly establish itself in central California, uh, which was something of a backwater at that time, demonstrates the power and pervasiveness of both advertising and the media. The extremely wealthy um, could uh, differentiate themselves from the rest of society, or these up-and-comers, through what was known as conspicuous consumption a term coined by sociologist Thorstein Veblen. Veblen was a highly influential American sociologist and economist who was quite critical of the emerging consumer culture in the United States. Uh, he published the book The Theory of the Leisure Class in 1899. You can see a copy on the right. And he coined the term, as I mentioned earlier, conspicuous consumption. His work uh, criticized the lavish spending on goods and services that are purchased principally for the purpose of showing off wealth rather than to satisfy some actual um, physical consumer need. Uh, Veblen argued that the social separations and division of labor of the feudalist era continued into the modern era. Um, he observed that uh, feudal lords engaged in economically useless behaviors of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure, while the middle and lower classes perform the actual work that maintains society. Veblen's investigation of uh, phenomena such as business cycles and consumer prices and of the technologically oriented division of labor into specializations uh, eventually uh, proved to be rather accurate predictions of modern industrial society, although he did have his critics. Um, in an article in 1894 entitled The Economic Theory of Women's Dresses, Veblen observed that the three fundamental principles of women's dresses, at least as advertised, so he was examining both the physical nature of the dress and the way it was being marketed, uh, these three principles were expensiveness, novelty, uh, so it had to be new and it had to be uh, expensive, and finally ineptitude. So it, it needed to, in Veblen's words, afford evidence of incapacitating the wearer for any gainful occupation, he put it. Uh, he also said, and this is another quote, the ideal of dress is to demonstrate to all observers and to compel observation of the fact that the wearer is manifestly incapable of doing anything that is of any use. The modern civilized woman's dress attempts this demonstration of habitual idleness and it succeeds measurably. Now again he's not without its critics and there is a uh, there's an element of condescension toward women in uh, that comes through in Veblen's work but I think uh, some of his critiques were um, were, were spot-on in terms of uh, analyzing the emerging American consumer culture even you know with regard to even setting aside rather his uh, his uh, weaknesses as a social critic. Uh, but this brings to a, a close our brief examination of the rise of American consumerism.